Good morning, and welcome to my joyous rant about the need for us to evolve education. I want to talk a little bit about the why. I want to share a little bit with you around how we're trying to evolve education at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. But I also want to share some ideas and some thinking I have around how the GLAM sector actually might join with education to be part of that journey as well. For more than a century, our education model, for the most part, has remained unchanged, particularly in the secondary sector. We have been forcing students through unrelated single subjects, often teaching them through a single teacher, often forcing these young people to sit confined in a single cell classroom. I believe we have been force feeding our young people a one size fits all model of education for way too long. And increasingly, we're actually running out of excuses for continuing to do so. If there is one thing of which we are certain, the only constant now in society is change. We only have to look at the world around us and look at the rate at which technology is changing things. Looking at the rate at which that is changing our services, our society and our workplaces. These young people are going to have to be built for change, not one set of skills. They are going to have to become adaptive experts who can actually cope with constant change and not just survive, but thrive in that environment. And I think we need to take time to look at this idea. If the rate of change outside of an organisation exceeds the rate of change inside, the end is possibly near. It's at this point that I actually often point out that we're bloody lucky that schools provide a really cheap and reliable babysitting service. Because if we didn't, I believe people would actually be starting to vote with their feet. But we can't let the convenience of a standard school education be the reason that we keep doing the things the same way. We're actually entering a period where many students are learning in spite of school. They are learning beyond school and they're most certainly engaging in their passions outside of the classroom. Personally, I don't believe that is good enough. I think we must commit to changing the organisation to reflect the world that exists outside of that organisation. And often educators will come back to me and say, change is hard. Living below the poverty line is hard. Change is actually just uncomfortable. And we need to get used to that discomfort and actually embrace it. Luckily, the future is not something that is done to us. And the future of education is not a foregone conclusion. We are actually able to dictate and to shape the future of education. We have the capacity and the ability to be active partners in beginning to design the education that we want. 
Too often we accept the status quo as good enough. Too often we're scared to make the changes because people bring out that hokey line, where is the evidence that what you're going to do is going to work? We need to remember, followers follow the research. Leaders create the research. And I believe that we in New Zealand are very well placed to create the body of research that suggests that doing things differently will improve outcomes for our young people. We also need to consider our measures of success in education. It is not good enough to look to NCEA, university entrance, and national standards as our measure of success. Yes, they have their place, and measuring an acquisition of certain skills and knowledge, but they by no means measure what it means to be successful and prepared to be successful in a future life. These young people need to gain competencies, skills and dispositions that will allow them to thrive in that changing world. And we also need to ensure that they maintain well-being so often our unerring focus on academic success is actually at the expense of the health and the joy of young people. We need to be looking after those young people and ensuring that they have the skills to contribute in every way possible. They need to be creative, they need to be collaborative, they need to be problem solvers, they need to be innovators, they need to be entrepreneurs. So there's some ideas that keep coming up around how we might fix education. And this next little bit comes with a bit of a warning because I think there are some potential smoke screens that we see as signs of innovation. Every freaking conference I've been to in the last six months has talked about design thinking. Design thinking is awesome, and it is a stunning strategy to learn and to introduce to our students. But it is not new. Inquiry learning, Genuine, deep inquiry is what we're actually needing to teach our young people and giving them the capacity to engage in independent inquiry. So again, don't get me wrong, design thinking has its place and it seems to have gathered some sort of momentum as a, a fashionable term for inquiry. And I say we take that opportunity and we use it, but we don't get our blinkers on about it. We actually acknowledge that it is simply building on what we know should be very good inquiry learning. Similarly, this thing. Every school is suddenly creating a makerspace, quite often a makerspace in their library. And again, that is great. And I encourage people to do so. But actually, the makerspace is only a symbol of something. It's a symbol of students being able to rapidly prototype, tinker, create, play, explore. And I think we would be better advised to not get too distracted by the makerspaces, but actually, how might something like a makerspace support our students to engage in authentic projects. How do we get students to see that they have a very real part in addressing and solving their school, their community, their country, or their world's real problems? We need to give our young people the skills and the strategies to participate in authentic projects with authentic problems, authentic partners, and very real outcomes at the end of it and actions. 
So often we kid ourselves and we say kids are doing a project which is little more than a recipe with a foregone conclusion. If you know that they are actually going to all be producing a scale model of the planets, don't kid yourself that that's an authentic project. They need to be based in the real world, tackling real problems. And again, another term that we seem to have become in love with in education. Suddenly, everyone must code. And if you're not coding, you're so last year. But in reality, reality coding isn't the skill that we're talking about. It's about the ability to engage in complex communication and have the language and the literacy to engage in that complex communication. It breaks my heart a little bit when you see all these kids running off to Code Academy with little understanding of why they might be doing it and how they might be applying it in a real context to potentially solve one of those real problems that they were doing in an authentic project. Coding needs a context. And I think we might be better served actually thinking about digital freedom. One of my biggest bugbears with education and with schools in New Zealand is that we have been given this gift of ultra-fast broadband being delivered to our schools and this incredible infrastructure which is now nearly available to every school in New Zealand. Yet we are distracting ourselves and diverting ourselves by worrying about how we might best filter the learning experience. How can we control the internet that our young people use? How can we shut it down to a limited number of resources that they can access? Who are we to decide what the appropriate platform is for them to learn? I do as much learning through social platforms as Facebook and Twitter as I do through any formal learning management system. We need to stop kidding ourselves that we are helping students to help themselves by limit their experience. Like us, they need to learn how to manage distractions. They need to learn how to not just gorge themselves on Snapchat and Facebook and to use their time productively. They need to be given the opportunity to develop very real complex communication skills. And to do that, they actually need to be in a position to go out there and explore every tool and platform available and start making judgments about what's the appropriate tool and platform to use. They need to have a real sense of agency and ownership of their ability to use the tools that are available to them on the internet. We need to be providing an opportunity for our young people to become increasingly free-range learners. We need to start taking off all of the boundaries and the controls if we are honest, if you look at a traditional school timetable, it is little more than an organisational and controlling tool. It's, all, it's a system by which you organise large numbers of young people to move efficiently through a day and a week. It has very little to do with meeting the needs or the interests of that learner. As I said before, we are delivering up a one-size-fits-all education that actually has little consideration of a student's past, a student's present, and most importantly, a student's future. So how are we beginning to disrupt education at Hobsonville Point Secondary School? 
As Thomason mentioned, I've been lucky enough to be part of a brand new school being set up in Hobsonville Point in Auckland, which is sort of west north of Auckland. We opened for students in 2014. And um, we are what's called a modern learning environment school. So we are a state school. We offer the New Zealand curriculum like any other school. We got mistaken initially for a charter school because we're a public-private partnership school. That simply means we're part of a new initiative that the ministry are trying out, which means that our buildings were built for 1,350 students from day one, and our buildings were then leased out to a private company, and we are in there as tenants. And what that means for us as a senior leadership team is that we can focus purely on the teaching and learning and the pedagogy at our school. We do not need to be distracted by the property management. So we are very much a state school, a public school who is providing the um, teaching and learning based around the New Zealand curriculum. One of the funny things about a new school is that we can only take in zone for the first few years, and we can only take year on year if we're a secondary school. So at the moment, we're in our second year, which means we have year nine and year 10 students who are just from the surrounding community, which means we have around 250 students. The gift for us was time. So in 2013, the year before we um, opened, we were lucky enough as a senior leadership team to travel. We traveled through Canada, and looked at the self-directed learning movement. We travelled through some schools in America and saw um, you know, some stuff that, we, that blew us away, the big picture schools really had an effect on us. We also saw a whole lot of schools that we were underwhelmed by, the so-called Apple schools, where people just waved iPads in our faces. And um, we also travelled through Australia and, of course, New Zealand. And, and those of you who lived um, down in Christchurch, you will know that innovative education has already been going on in your Discovery School and Unlimited, and even places like Hagley High School that have got incredible partnerships with the wider community. So we had the opportunity to survey the educational landscape. And we came to the conclusion very quickly that we would be remiss if we simply opened the doors and did what we've done before. So we had to go through this incredible process of de-schooling and unlearning. Because whilst the four of us in the senior leadership team were all appointed for our crazy left field thinking and um, bright eyed bushy tail desire to change education, the reality is all of us came through the same traditional model as most of our kids are experiencing now. So I was educated at Rangitoto College. I taught my first seven years at Rangitoto College in Auckland and Takapuna Grammar and Epsom Girls Grammar and Auckland Girls Grammar School. So I had seen great learning for all intents and purposes going on at a range of traditional high schools. But still all of us were convinced that what we were doing is not good enough and that we had the gift of a clean slate and that we were gonna do something bloody awesome with that clean slate. And so we're two years in at this point. So we have now established what we refer to as our foundation program. So being a modern learning environment, I'm not sure if, if you all know that from now on, the Ministry of Education has made a commitment that any new builds have to comply to what they call, it was a modern learning environment, I believe they've changed it to an innovative learning environment. They like changing phrases. Um, but basically means the same thing. So the idea that the single cell classroom is not the default. You don't get your Nelson blocks anymore. Instead, we are moving to open spaces, but more importantly, flexible spaces. Because as we know, we don't all want to exist in a single great big open space either. There are times when we do need to be in more cell-like classrooms. So it's about creating a flexible space where you have the opportunity to be truly responsive to your learning needs. So um, Hobsonville Point Secondary School has a 250 metre single runway that goes through the middle of the school. And off that, we have what we call um, learning community spaces or learning spaces. So big open spaces um, with little breakout spaces off of that. We are driven 
by these three words. Innovate, engage, inspire. So everything we do is looked at through this filter. So we are going to innovate through personalising learning. We are going to engage through powerful partnerships. And we aim to inspire through deep challenge and inquiry. And those three principles are the measure and the test that we run every decision by. So what are we doing differently? Well, we have structured our whole curriculum different to a, second, a traditional secondary high school. So normally you'd go into high school and you know it'd be time to have your different subjects and departments. You know that you might have a form class that you check into in the morning, and then you go off to your English, math, science, and so on and so forth throughout the day. Well, we've decided that actually there's many parts to a curriculum that need highlighting, and they're not necessarily just those single subjects. So we have divided our time and our um, curriculum into what we call three sort of areas of our curriculum design. Learning hubs, learning modules, and projects. And I'll explain how each of those work. So learning hubs are a little bit like a form class on steroids. Usually, schools make bold claims about a form teacher being an academic coach, yet they actually only give that teacher about 15 minutes every day to take the role and read the daily notices to their students. We recognise that if we were going to have an adult who was going to take responsibility for a group of students, so we have one adult who will work with one group, and when we're at capacity, the idea is that they will be a vertical group of students, so that means a range of ages, and that they will stay with that one adult for their five years of their high school experience. And that will be their home base. And they will spend proper time with those students. So we have divided up their curriculum and learning hubs into three areas. So my learning, they have 90 minutes a week as a group where they focus on developing a student's ability to learn to learn. So not just throwing them into the context of a subject, they're actually developing skills around goal setting, around evidencing their learning, around planning their learning journey. So our students from day one get to choose all elements of their curriculum and their day, but they need an adult to support them in doing that. When you're 13 and 14 and you're given absolute choice, what are you gonna do? You're possibly not gonna choose a really challenging range or a diverse range. So they're, we're there to support them in doing that. That is the one adult that can contact, that contacts home every couple of weeks. So if you think of that from a perspective as you as a parent, how often did you feel like you had a relationship with an adult at your son or daughter's high school? Admittedly, your son and daughter might not have wanted you to have that relationship at times. But the reality is, come high school, adult, the parents and the family and the whanau are actually shut out. And we um, don't believe that is the best for anyone. We have an open door policy. We believe that we don't enrol a student, we enrol a family. So we will get to know you as a family. And we will build on that relationship for five years. That's quite scary really, isn't it? Uh, there's no escaping us. We also have my being. So this learning hub space, another 90 minutes a week, is where you look at yourself as a round-wounded human being. We have what we call the Hobsonville habits. These are dispositions that we want our students to develop. We value personal excellence equally to um, academic excellence. And we see our Hobsonville habits as a realisation of personal excellence or a way you might develop personal excellence. So it's things like creativity, resilience, um, critical thinking, problem solving, those sorts of things are the things that you develop within your Hobsonville habits. My being is also the space where we explore uh, the concept of heora and the health curriculum and how we actually look after our young people and ensure that they are not only clever, 
but that they are happy and healthy as they can be as well. Too often we value the academic and we forget to value the human being. So this is our way of saying we think it's important. We are gonna carve out real time to focus on this. And then we also have a 90 minute block where we focus on developing as a community. And this might be developing as a community within your little learning hub, which is gonna be capped at around 15, 16, or each learning hub is also part of a wider learning community. We have three learning communities across the school. It might be developing those relationships there. Or it might be developing the relationship with our wider school community and the area that we live in. So um, those of you who don't know about Hobsonville Point, we're a crazy little um, communi community out on the northwest. We used to be the Air Force Base, and now we are this sort of crazy, quickly growing suburb that is um, full of high density housing, but also um, really lovely green spaces. It's actually been incredibly well designed, even though it is incredibly high density housing. And we uh, have a once in a life opportunity to be um, part of establishing that community. So we do a lot of work with them. And then we have learning modules. And the easy way that secondary schools attack this is that they have subjects. It's really easy to divide up your English, math, science and go put everyone in little compartments and off you go. But we don't believe that leads to connected deep learning. So we have created a model of integrated learning modules. And I'll just quickly try and hurt your head with the process we went through to set this up. So we had a crack team of educators who took the New Zealand curriculum. We looked at each of the learning areas. We mapped what we saw as the threshold concepts that would get you through to year nine, year 10, ready for year 12. And so for each learning area, we established that there were a set of very clear threshold concepts and skills that you had to know by the time that you got to year 11 and, and, and starting to get ready for the qualification years. And then we came up with what we call our overarching concepts. Eight concepts that were taken from across the curriculum. Concepts such as innovation, sustainability, those big ideas that are really important to education and to New Zealand. And every term, so we have created what we call a two-year programme. The foundation programme is year nine and 10. It's composite. So you have a mixture of um, sort of 13 to 15 year olds in all of your classes. And it is divided up into eight terms with the eight overarching concepts providing the structure. We get together as educators and we actually come up with ideas for interconnected, integrated modules. So a group of us might know we're in together on these blocks, so we're gonna get together and pair up. So last year, I taught, um, I'm an English teacher. I taught a module called um, Game Over, and it was looking at the gamification of war, and I taught this with a science teacher. She was exploring the nature of science that sat in behind the human psyche that lends itself to the gamification of war but also looked at the technologies that are now allowing for the gamification war and actually looking at gaming design. And I, as an English teacher, reveled in the opportunity to look at texts like Ender's Game and the very many novels that deal with these issues. And of course, science fiction is the beautiful intersection of English and science. And more and more, we have seen these beautiful intersections of subjects creating the most beautiful deep learning. Far richer than anything I experienced at school. And actually it's resulting in students being engaged in a way that I have really seen consistently across the board. So students come in, they can select three different learning modules, a combination of any two subjects. And they sit there and do that with their learning coach to ensure that they've got a breadth and a coverage of learning areas. So this encourages connected learning. It is inquiry based. We actually insist that all of our semester long modules have a period of upfront learning and then increasingly self-directed learning. So by midway through, the students should be engaged in pretty much independent inquiry based learning about the topic. They are composite grouping. That forces us to genuinely differentiate because often when we get a year group, we can presume they're pretty same-same. 
when you have 13 to 15 year olds sitting in front of you, you are challenged to understand curriculum levels and deliver a range of appropriate pathways and strategies for them. So we have those integrated small learning modules. We have these magic little opportunities to do spins, which are single one-off um, subjects once a week. That allows you to dive deeper into a learning area that you're passionate about or receive extension or support. So I'm indulging in a mod, I'm doing a little spin around the future of storytelling this term. So last term I looked at all the traditional aspects of creative writing and improving their creative writing. This term we're aiming to look off into the future and see how Oculus and Twine and um, how transmedia storytelling is starting to evolve and what might the future hold. They are going to go off and explore that stuff and they're going to have a bloody good go at creating it. And if they fail, that's fine. They've learnt a hell of a lot along the way. And then we have my time. That's three blocks a week where even at 13 or 14, you are negotiating what's best for you. So you might slot into a self-directed learning period where you go and look after yourself. There are teachers on floor time looking after you and supporting you. Or you might, in, you might offer a pop-up session for other students to come to or teachers might be offering pop-up sessions that are of interest to you, or you might um, actually be sent along to an extra module for support or extension. And then we have a whole day dedicated to big projects. So our students are engaged in semester-long big projects that are about serving our wider community. This is about them being facilitated by a teacher, particularly in the junior school, so they're very much a supported, guided version of authentic projects, but they have an authentic context and authentic clients who they are serving. So we have people that, uh, we have had students who have actually cleaned up the foreshore of Hobsonville Point and created an education um, sort of a project informing people as to how to stop it happening again in the future. We had nurseries that were out there on the past and caused an incredible amount of pollution. We have saved the epilobium. It's a weed that supposedly needs saving and we've done it. We've had students who worked with um, community to go and find the very small patches of epilobium and have repropagated it and again have created an award winning little documentary about the epilobium and why it needed to be saved. We have had students who have created sustainable landscape design and gone and created those gardens for people that are moving into the community. They are engaged in very real world projects with very real world um, outcomes. So this is not busy work. This is high stakes. They have real money that they're often working with, with real clients and very real expectations. And sometimes it makes us want to pull our hair out because I don't know if you've worked with, ask Glenn, he came in and worked with some of our 13 and 14 year olds. They're like herding cats. They've got all the great ideas in the world, but they're still learning how to follow through. But my God, give them an opportunity and they will grow and they will respond. Our young people are as capable of as little or as much as we think they are capable of. So often we underestimate what they can actually achieve. And it's really important that our young people have an opportunity to develop a we not me culture. We know they are developing habits. My God, they're the generation of the selfie. They are all about looking at themselves on their devices. We need to work hard to remind them that for our world to be the world we want it to be, we have to be we not me. And the idea is that our senior students will do increasingly independent impact projects. They will come up and they will pitch an idea to us and we will give them the amount of freedom and resources we believe they need according to their preparedness for that. So the idea is that they're becoming increasingly independent. We also have established a really neat program um, which reminded me of the innovation hub that the Auckland, Auckland Museum spoke about yesterday. We have space. We have the gift of a lot of space at the moment. So we've come up with an initiative that we have opened our doors to um, sort of particularly creative tech type industry people 
If you're a young, well, you don't have to be young, you can be any age. If you're a startup and you're, you're trying to get a business going and you happen to be Auckland-based and want a really cool place to hang out, come and knock on our door. So the way that the pollinator works is that you come in and we give you space. So we've carved out a learning hub that's for them to be based in. We give you free Wi-Fi, really cool people to hang out with, tea and coffee. And in exchange, you are available as a mentor to our students for a little bit of that time. So we have Tanya Gray from the Gather Workshop. She is based with us. We have Dimitri and James and Sav from Thought Wired who do the um, sort of the brain sensing technology software. And you can imagine the sort of things that those guys, the plans they are hatching with our students. We've got these crazy kids that are in there coming up with this idea for a brain controlled immersive reality game. And actually we can say, go for it. Go and talk to their experts, they're just down the hallway. More schools need to start making greater, um, sort of make, you know, seizing this opportunity. If you can carve out a space, open your door to the communities outside and get them physically coming in, as well as us going out. So this is part Startup Incubator, it's part Innovation Hub. We are providing partners and mentors and our Pollinator people are saying that it is as rich for them, if not more so, than it is for our students. They are loving the thinking that comes from our young people. Because our people, you know, our young people haven't been told that you can't do things yet. They come in with all sorts of crazy ideas. We also embrace true blended learning. We insist that everything exists online so you can engage in your learning 24-7. It's about having an open internet. We had to sign off all sorts of papers with Network for Learning for them to get rid of their bloody filtering. Because actually, if you have filtering, they're gonna set up a, a VPN in a heartbeat and get on those sites anyway. Yeah, who are we kidding? These kids know how to get around any kind of filtering you put up there. So let's open the internet and let's instead have a conversation about digital citizenship and the consequences and the implications of what might happen when they make mistakes. And yes, they make mistakes. I have had earnest conversations about the inappropriateness of looking at Shrek porn on Vine. <laughs> but it was a learning opportunity. Who did that harm? Yes, it harmed the donkey, but who else? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to have very real conversations. We are kidding ourselves. We have parents coming in with screenshots going, oh my goodness, they're sexting. And it's like, yes, of course they are. They're 13, 14. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's acknowledge the reality. We all got up to dumb things. Thank God I didn't live in the age of social media when I was out nightclubbing. <laughs> you know, let's, I actually I feel for this generation because we got away with a hell of a lot of fun knowing that people weren't going to take a photo and put it online the next moment. We've got to work with these guys and acknowledge that there are dangers, but there are incredible opportunities as well. We're also brand and platform agnostic. It gives me the heebie-jeebies when schools become Apple schools or Microsoft schools or Google schools. Yes, we use all of those things at our school, but the key is we use all of them, plus Linux, plus anything else that's appropriate. Because the real world is increasingly bland, bland? not bland, brand and platform agnostic. Gaming is encouraged. Our library is the home of gaming. Online gaming, board gaming, all of it. It's part of life. And we focus on that idea of digital citizenship. If they're gonna learn to behave appropriately, you've gotta give them the chance to actually be citizens online, not cotton wool them. They've gotta to learn to make mistakes and then make it right. So how might you help in your sector? I firmly believe this is not just in the hands of educators within the schooling sector. We have an incredible shared responsibility to all be disrupting and also all be helping. So I believe you guys have a really neat opportunity to disrupt. I think you need to assume leadership. You guys have mastered the art of free range learning since the beginning of time. That's what a gallery, what a library, I don't know, is it what archives is? It's definitely what museums are. <laughs> they are opportunities to experience curated collections and 
for the person to go in and engage with it and learn for themselves. You guys have a hell of a lot you can be teaching schools and educators. And I believe it is now the time where you assume leadership because in so many ways, you are living future-focused education already. You are the MLE. Often within a school, I talk about a library representing Sweden. It is not owned by any one learning area or subject. It is the neutral territory where people can come together. You can open your doors for people to do blended learning that their single cell classrooms might not be able to facilitate. You can be that space. And you can be part of this network, connecting up the nodes. Schools are nodes that need to be connected with you guys and vice versa. We need to get much better at building firm, solid connections. You may be aware that there's a huge initiative in place in education where schools are being encouraged to um, create communities of schools or what's now being referred to as communities of learning. Often to the future, schools will only be able to access professional learning money if they are part of a community of school. At least that's the main way they will access extra professional learning. And a community of school is a geographical collection of schools who join together working towards a common outcome. Now my question to you is why aren't you part of the communities of learning? Or how might you become part of the communities of learning? Either physically or virtually? Be the innovation hub. I worked on the 21st Century Reference Group for the government looking at the needs um, of education off into the future. We kept harping on about the need for there to be these innovation hubs that educators could go to and start reprogramming themselves and start trying different strategies. Why aren't you guys the innovation hubs? In a sense, you always have been. But start identifying yourself as this. Be project partners. I look at the stuff our young people are doing and I think about the projects that I've heard that you guys are doing and think, my God, how much bigger and richer would these be if they were in partnership with our schools and our students in very real time? You have an untapped resource in those students. Yes, they are like herding cats, but once you've got into the cat herding business, you can take advantage of a whole lot of cheap labour, no, but um, of a whole lot of um, talent and, and opportunities and skills. And you will learn from each other, believe me. I've been learning for 20 years now. You can be project clients. They need authentic clients to create authentic projects. Why can't that be you? Why aren't they designing your next exhibition? I know with the Minecraft um, exhibition at the Auckland Museum, that had real student engagement. And I know taking my daughters there who are in 9-11, that was the most engaged they have ever been with a museum exhibition. Because in a sense, it was for kids, by kids. They understand the market. I believe we will get the best outcomes if we work together on this. If we co-construct the future of education. New Zealand is small enough for us to actually do something really magic and really different, we need to knock down the barriers between school and those institutions and galleries and libraries and archives and museums. We are one great big learning environment that should be working together to realise the future of education in New Zealand. I think of those student labs that were mentioned yesterday. The labs in the, um, was it library labs or museum labs? Why not have students in those labs? Why not open the door to them? I want to encourage you guys to host unconferences for the education sector. These last two days, one of the things I put online is actually my favourite kind of education conference is a non-education conference. I have learned so much more from you 
don't tell the other conference providers, then um, the other conferences I have come from, because by God, we're stuck in an echo chamber. All I am hearing is people talking about design thinking, makerspaces, coding, robotics, it's the future. Actually, we need to look beyond that. And I believe the only way we can do that is by working together. And I want to close by giving you guys an invitation. I would like to invite you on behalf of the education sector. Don't, I didn't actually ask their permission, but it's okay, let's go for it. I would like us to go free range together. Thank you. Claire for a really compelling uh, presentation and um, we've got a couple of minutes so we can probably take one or two questions if anybody has something they'd like to ask. I think we've got one uh, just here, um, just behind you Vivian, um, yeah. Do you want to say yeah. Can I go? Um, I'm a librarian working in quite a small community in Oamaru, Waitaki, um, and I'm really excited. Um, we also um, have at least one library in a primary school, and I think the new principal has very similar ideas that you are um, that you proposed this morning. Um, now, just. Going back to your school, how do you use the library? How is the library part of this this web okay, of so learning? The, the library we talk about as, A, it's the home of digital citizenship. We actually see libraries and, and digital um, as, as sort of a, a marriage between the two. It is a physical open plan space. It is a space where we have a heck of a lot of um, I like what the term tree books. Um, we, we believe it's really important that our students have a really um, rich, diverse range of texts there, physical texts and physical books, but it is also um, the space where they can access um, the internet. It's, it's, it's one of our learning hubs, to be honest. I, I barely separate our library from any other space in our school. Um, it's open plan. It's um, Self-issuing, our kids come in and they self-issuing um, books off a, um, just to go through a machine. Our theory is if they steal books, well, woo, it's a win. Um, <laughs> so we're determined not to close it off in any way. It's everything is on wheels. And um, the idea is that because it has to be an adaptable space like every other space in our school, it is the place where you go to if you need any other digital devices or tools. You go up and you issue them from the desk like... Um, you would anything else. Um, our librarian, she happens to be our digital citizenship leader, and so she supports in that area. But she also is the person that helps us um, curate information um, according to our needs as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky. I, my job as a DP, my, uh, I've got the best mixture of responsibilities in the world. Um, so I look after the professional learning of our staff, I look after the ICT and e-learning infrastructure, and I also look after the library. And, and to me, they are all interconnected. Our library is always the place we do our professional learning in. It's where I run my classes, um, but it's also very much the place that supports digital citizenship, citizenship in our school, and is the, uh, that place that can curate um, and support people in finding information as well. Sorry, I think we'll just take, we'll just have to take one more. You can always ask me the questions yeah. over morning tea or lunch as well. Yeah, so we'll go here. Hi, I just wondered how you took um, individual learning styles into account. Yeah, so um, one of the th things that we often talk about is um, universal design for learning, underpinning our learning design at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. So that idea that there should be... Um, choice within your learning design. There should be choice around receiving your information through a range of contexts and, and um, so it should be available through written, 
visual oral if possible. Also that students should have choice to work in the spaces that are most comfortable for them. That's where our um, ubiquitous access to learning is really important. We recognise that for some students that um, their best learning happens at night. I don't know if you've ever tracked a teenager's um, learning patterns. They often actually really get into doing stuff. And, and we can judge and we can say, oh, they should be sleeping. But actually, um, for some students, that's the, the best way for them to learn. So we, we often talk about differentiating by choice. So ensuring that as much as possible, the way they receive information is there's a variety of ways they can do so. The way they can process information. We have some students who like having an exercise book alongside um, their, we do use um, Hapara and Google Drive and as a default things are pushed out into their Google folders. Um, but if a student likes working with a folder or a 1B5 because that floats their boat, like I know in my creative writing class, there are students who love handwriting. And I acknowledge that we are diverse and that there is real power in technology but there's also real power in personalisation. And also, increasingly, you will not see a single way that students have to evidence their learning. So, for instance, in English, and this, I mean, I've worked for years in the English sector. I was involved in writing the achievement standards, and, I've, um, and one of my biggest bugbears is we make them write essays all the time. And in the age of complex communication, that's not good enough. If they want to, you know, share a, a voice recording or a podcast or a video to evidence their learning, unless I am measuring their ability to write, we should be giving them the choice. Okay, well, I think we might have to just wrap it up uh, just in the interest of time. But thanks so much, Claire. Please join me in thanking Claire again. Thank you.